Okay, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 6. I'm going to read verse 16. Actually, let's read from verse 13. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. And so, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. The question of oaths and vows and that comes up every now and then, so we'll deal with it this morning. And what is suggested here in verse 16 is the reason why one takes an oath is, as he says, it's, it's, it's given as a confirmation uh, uh, of what's been said before God, which of course would have meant for the Jewish mind and for all of those who are godly and fear God that you cannot lie in the presence of God. To do so is to dishonor him and to take his name in vain. So it's, it was a very serious matter but when somebody took the name of God and pronounced what they said to be true in the presence of God, that for all those who are godly and share with each other that same faith should be the finish of the matter. That should finish it. He's telling the truth. Or she's telling the truth. We can see an example of this and how beneficial it, it could be especially in judicial matters, uh, in Exodus chapter 22. In Exodus 22, beginning verse, with verse uh, 10, it says, If a man gives his neighbor a donkey, an ox, a sheep, or any animal to keep for him and it dies or is hurt or is driven away while no one is looking an oath before the Lord shall be made by the two of them that he has not laid hands on his neighbor's property and its owner shall accept it and he shall not make restitution so here's something that happened to what was borrowed uh, and it was without the uh, it was out, out of sight of the one who had borrowed the animal and the animal's damaged. Now of course the person who has lent the animal wants restitution for the animal but this man is claiming he wasn't responsible for it. It didn't, it didn't, he didn't do anything deliberate uh, he took all the precautions he could. This was outside of the normal realm of precaution. And so he would take an oath, obviously in the presence of a judge and of the neighbour, and the neighbour and him would be reconciled and he would not have to pay restitution because he made the oath in the presence of God and the neighbour accepted it. It's that sort of trustworthiness that is necessary under these circumstances. I know years ago, uh, people would make an agreement and it could involve a lot of money and they would do it on the basis of a handshake. And for the most part, that handshake was really an oath or a promise to do what they said they were going to do or to pay what they said they were going to pay. So we've moved, unfortunately, away from that sort of trust and now it feels like you can't trust anybody's word. 
Now that's unfortunate for our society, but it must not be so among the Christians. We must be trustworthy. The words that come out of our mouth must be in truth and in righteousness. Our responsibility is to act in sincerity and in truth and to speak in sincerity and in truth at all times. There's another incident which I think helps. <coughs> Remember Rahab uh, who hid the spies that had come into Jericho, had been sent out by Joshua and they were hidden then from the soldiers of the king of Jericho by Rahab. And the reason she did this was because she heard what God had done for Israel. And she knew that nobody was going to be able to withstand them if God was on their side. So she wanted to let them know she had a faith in God. She asked when they were leaving to take an oath or to make, as she says, a pledge of truth to preserve the lives of her father and mother, her sisters, her brothers, and all who belong to them. Joshua 2, 12 to 21. The court, they said in reply that they would, but that she needed to take the cord, which uh, was made of scarlet thread, so it was a, a scarlet rope, and she had let them down through her window over the wall so that they could escape. And the sign to the invading armies of the oath that had been taken was that that cord was tied probably on, in a bow on the window. Once they saw that, they knew an oath had been taken and those people, if they remained inside that house, would not be touched. The oath was kept, thank God, and Rahab and her family members were blessed with life and prosperity, both spiritual and physical, as a result. So you see, when we speak the truth before God and before man, it is a blessing for people. And we must understand that. I know it seems very hard at times to speak the truth, but it's a blessing. The truth is a blessing. Anything less than that is a curse. Let's have a look at oaths in the Old Testament. Leviticus 19 verse 12. <clears throat> in this passage of scripture, <clears throat> he encourages them <clears throat> in this way. You shall not swear falsely by my name so as to profane the name of your God, I am the Lord, he says. Now, <clears throat> I mean, the implication in this is, you shall swear honestly by my name, and in doing so you will not profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. As I said, to swear falsely, was to profane the name of the Lord. It was to take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, the third commandment. It's a very serious matter altogether. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 23. Beginning of verse 21. When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it, for it would be sin in you, and the Lord your God will surely require it of you. However, if you refrain from vowing, it would not be a sin in you. Now, obviously there was vows made to God to offer peace offering or to, to uh, sacrifice a thank offering, uh, whatever. Uh, uh, or that they were going to dispose of 
certain property which were goods that they had uh, and they were going to dedicate it to the Lord. Uh, so there was vows of that nature. And he says, you better, if you vowed it, you better keep your vow. If you don't, I'll require it of you. When we're dealing with God, we've got to get it out of our heads that this God is just like Santa Claus or some other old man that you're dealing with and you think not too much of. So you'll talk the way you want and you will talk disrespectfully to God or flippantly or, uh, or in any other way that would bring reproach on God. It's, it's all wrong. You've got to come into the presence of God with fear and trembling. He is God after all. God, almighty God. Perfect and holy. All powerful, all knowing. And if we don't get some fear out of that, I don't know where we're going to go. We need to be careful when we stand before the Lord. <clears throat> Just reading on. Verse 23. You shall be careful to perform what goes out from your lips just as you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised. It was a vow, but it was a promise. You've got to keep your word. Jeremiah wanted Israel, when they returned to the Lord, to swear... As the Lord lives in truth, in justice, and in righteousness. There's, there's the configuration of an oath for you. When you're swearing or taking an oath, you're speaking to the living God. The Lord who lives. And you're doing it in truth. To the best of your ability, in truth, in justice, and in righteousness with the intention that right will be established on this earth and in your life and before God the right will be done this was in keeping with what was revealed in the law for you shall fear the Lord your God you shall serve him cling to him and you shall swear by his name Deuteronomy 10 verse 20 Swearing before God was not just uh, something that was permitted, it was something that was encouraged. Because it brought the Lord into your life and into the lives of the people round about you. And it demonstrated your faith and your fear of God as you carried out your word in righteousness and, and in truth. There's always a problem though, isn't there? Backsliding Israel was not trustworthy. Hear this, O house of Jacob, who are named Israel and who came forth from the loins of Judah, who swear by the name of the Lord and invoke the God of Israel, but not in truth nor in righteousness. This was the message poor Isaiah had to bring to his own people. <coughs> Things are so bad here, Oh, you're, you're mouthing the words of oaths to God, but it's not in truth. You're lying. It's not in righteousness. It's not for establishing what is right. You're doing it for your own evil, wicked ends, your greedy attitude or, or pleasures. You're doing it for those reasons, not for God, not for truth, not for righteousness. See the difference? An honest oath before God in truth and justice and righteousness is an oath that helps to achieve God's purpose of establishing truth and righteousness in the earth. Anything less than that is a slur on the name of God of, on, on what is true and what is righteous. Jacob also made a vow. If God will be with me, 
and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear and I return to my father's house in safety then the Lord will be my God Genesis 28 20 to 21 now he was setting out on his own he was leaving his parents he was going into the unknown and he asked God lots of things about the ordinary everyday stuff why is it that we don't want to ask God about the ordinary everyday stuff? Do you think he is not providing it? Or that he's not willing to provide it for you? Why don't we like Jacob ask for protection on our journey? Ask for food to eat and clothes to wear and for your own safety into the future? On the basis that God is your God. Oh, those are the things. All that's there. I don't need to ask God for any of this stuff. No, you're just acknowledging where it came from. And you're just showing a thankful heart that I've been given it. I do not deserve it. We are so sanitized here in the West. We, 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 we don't see real poverty. We don't see people dying on the streets. Except they're shot, of course. But not just dying from hunger or dying from neglect. Dying from sickness. We don't see orphans running around begging at cars. Street children who have no protection. And nobody who cares for them. Trying to etch a living from a hostile and manipulative world. God did answer this prayer. He brought Jacob back, a rich man with wives and many children. And Jacob made Yahweh his God for the rest of his adult life. Jacob's vow and his trust in God was worth making and keeping, not just for himself, but for his family, for the nation. And in truth, the blessing continues to be ours today in the whole world because of the promise made to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. If he'd have failed at this moment in time, we would have been the poorer for it. Hannah made a vow. Remember poor Hannah? She was a, a first wife or a second wife. There was two wives involved. The one was having children, no problem. Poor Hannah was having none. She, greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made a vow and said, O oh Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and a razor shall never come on his head. 1 Samuel 1, 10 to 11. She didn't get into the game of retaliating to the other wife although she was very hurt by the provocation that went on year after year, her being barren, as it were, and the other wife giving kids to the husband. Terrible. There's nothing, there's nothing under your skin like this would be under your skin. And the desire to retaliate and become bitter and to be to be disappointed with life and, and, and God and everything around you is massive. But she didn't go that road. You can go that road. She didn't go that road. And she was the better for it. She trusted God. She asked God for what she wanted. But not in a selfish way. I want a son because I want a son. I want a son but I'm prepared, Lord, to give that son to you all the days of his life. She got the son. And she called him Samuel. That was Samuel the prophet. She kept him 
while she weaned the child, which approximately three years. And then after that, she brought him up to the temple and dedicated him to the Lord for the rest of, of his life. He turned out to be a great prophet. And the benefit of her faithfulness and her desire and her willingness to ask God for what she wanted has helped many godly people who have been influenced by, for good by Samuel's life. Hannah's oath turned out to be a blessing for many people. Alas, I wish all the stories were good, they're not. You had somebody like Absalom. He used a vow in subterfuge to achieve his own wicked plans. He, he was telling his father while he was in exile, he made a, 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 an oath to God to offer sacrifice to him when he came back to his homeland. It was so plausible, David believed him and let him go down to Hebron. But in Hebron, he pronounced himself the king. And he set off a rebellion against his own father, who was the legitimate king, anointed by God, and whom he had no right to lift a finger against. There's times, like for Peter, when in the panic to save his own neck, swore in a public place he did not know Jesus. It got so bad he started to curse and swear to let them all believe he wasn't one of the disciples. He was just like them. Matthew 26, 71 to 75. It's this, when he realized what he had done and that Jesus had told him that he was going to do it, he went out and he wept bitterly. I'll give him that. At least he had a good conscience. At least he, did, he feared the Lord. At least he saw how wrong he was. And he wept bitterly over it. Would to God there was a little more weeping bitterly over the things that we do or don't do after making a promise to do them. Oats in the New Testament then. <clears throat> it's interesting to know that uh, Jewish converts continued to make vows after they became Christians. Look at Acts chapter 18, verse 18. <clears throat> Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria. And with him were Priscilla and Aquila. In Sancria he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow, it says. Some suggest this was a Nazarite vow. I can't see that it was a Nazarite vow. It had to be something less than that because a Nazarite couldn't then eat the fruit or drink the fruit of the vine. That would mean that Paul couldn't have partaken of the Lord's Supper. So that just, just doesn't run as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so it was something else, but it was a vow which he made to the Lord. Also, uh, in Acts 21, and in verse uh, 20, it says, When they heard it, they began glorifying God. Paul, Paul now was up in Jerusalem. And he was with uh, the other apostles and the elders and so forth. Uh, and uh, when they heard it, they began glorifying God. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. And they are all zealous for the law. And they've been told about you that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Therefore do this that we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take them and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and all will know that there is nothing to the thing which they have been told about you 
but that you yourself all walk orderly, keeping the law. So he goes and he, obviously he's, he's under pressure here, but he goes and he identifies with these four people who were under a vow, and he was willing to pay their expenses. Now it would take seven days before the sacrifices were offered. Uh, this was the term in which the purification took place. Uh, uh, but before the seven days were finished, he was accused of bringing Greeks into the temple. He was arrested and he was removed from the temple. Now, I'm not going to get into whether this was good or bad or indifferent. I'm just going to say that there were still Christians who were taking vows before the Lord. That's the point I just want to make here. Jesus, though, uh, it seems spoke about oaths disparagingly. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. Again, you have heard <coughs> that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil, he says. And that's strong and straightforward. And what Jesus said begs this question. Is this a prohibition against all oaths? That's the question that comes up. Well, before we decide that, let us look at the extra information about oaths in Jesus' discourse about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, because I think it throws a great light on what he's saying here. Let's go to Matthew chapter 23, beginning at verse 16. It says, Woe to you blind guides who say, Whoever swears by the temple, that is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple is obligated. You fools and blind men, which is more important, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? can't believe the Pharisees were so stupid. Anyway, verse 18, And whoever swears by the altar, that is nothing. But whoever swears by the offering on it, he is obligated. Of course, what they were trying to do is they were trying to give the people a way out. You're taking an oath, but you're not really taking an oath. This is subterfuge. This is deception. And that's what they were helping the people to do. Verse 19, blind men, which is more important, the offering or the, uh, or the altar that sanctifies the offering? Therefore, whoever swears by the altar swears both by the altar and everything on it, and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears both by the temple and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swear, uh, swears by heaven swears both by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. So it seems like in everyday affairs, oaths were being taken, not just in the judicial sense, but the way we did when we were kids. I promise you, I swear to God and hope to die, it's the truth. This is what we were into when we were kids. I don't know you did, if you did it when you were a kid. We, we, this is what we were doing. I don't know, others would say, I swear on my mother's grave, this is the truth. So it's a little game. And we probably knew exactly what we were doing too when we were saying these things. What I'm trying to say is that on, on an everyday basis, people were trying to show 
how um, truthful they were by taking an oath, but an oath which gave them a way out of having to keep what they had promised. And the Pharisees were aiding and abetting it in setting up little situations like this. You know, you swear uh, by uh, what's on the altar uh, and not by the altar and so forth. So uh, it's nonsense. I just add one more thing to that. Let me add one more thought. Whoever swears by his head, Jesus doesn't deal with that in the, in the review. He says, whoever swears by his head, swears by his own helplessness to make one hair white or black. So what sort of an oath is that? You have no power to keep it. You can't even turn one hair in your head white or black. No, I didn't turn this black. The children did. <laughs> the grandchildren did. <laughs> oh, white. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, I know you can dye your hair and everything, but that, that's not what he's talking about. You have not got the power by your will to change the very color of your hair. Now, if you are that powerless, <coughs> why are you swearing on your own head? You headbanger. <laughs> okay. This kind of double talk sounds good, but it's only another way of avoiding the obligation of a genuine oath. This offense was so common in everyday life among the Jews that it was hard that it had to be checked so people could return to honesty and integrity once more. The dishonesty was just rife. And unfortunately, in our day and age, it is just rife all over again. It seems to be the way of the wicked. But us, brethren, it should be, among us, a different matter. We need to be able to rely on each other that we're telling each <coughs> other the truth. And that's very important for us. The only remedy to such falsehoods are truth, honesty, candor, plainness of speech, scrupulousness, and straightforwardness on our part. James has it this way, but above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but your yes is to be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. I don't have to make it appear that I'm telling the truth. And why is that? Because I'm telling the truth. If I say yes, I mean yes. If I say no, I mean no. Just do it. Friends, even God swore by himself on occasions to give reassurance to those who heard him. We, we saw that in Hebrews 6, 16 through 20. The question is, did God do something wrong? Of course not. Jesus answered under oath when the high priest insisted, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, according to Psalm 110 verse 1, and coming on the clouds of heaven, according to Daniel 7 verse 13. All of that's recorded for us in Matthew 26, 63 to 64. I do not believe it is wrong to make an oath in the wedding ceremony to your husband-to-be or to your wife-to-be. I, nor do I believe it is wrong in a court of law to put my hand on the Bible and take an oath to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Because that's what I'll be doing anyway. What I will say is when you make a promise, a little bit of advice, when you promise to do something, keep your word and do it no matter what the cost to yourself in time or money. Inconvenience is no excuse for not keeping your word. That's more important than the inconvenience that you might experience in having to keep your word. While you are making the promise, and here's, here's the little bit of advice, 
If you feel there are things that will indeed relieve you of your obligation, then spell it out to the one receiving the promise, as did the spies to Rahab. They said, look, if anyone leaves that, your room up there, we are free of the oath that we've taken <coughs> in your presence and before God. If that, if that cord had not been tied on the window, they would have been free of their obligation. They explained this to her. She agreed with it. Now, what you're doing, if you're going to make a promise, this will stop you, first of all, so that you will think about what you're promising. And if there are any circumstances under which you feel you will be free from the obligation, you need to explain it at that point in time so that the people you're making the promise to know what the terms and the conditions are. That way we cannot be accused. Don't just take this for granted because how do they know what you're thinking? Just tell them. And that way, you're not going to get yourself into any trouble. Joshua admonished his fellow citizens, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and, and in truth. Joshua 24, 14. As a Christian, you must always be trustworthy, so let your yes be yes, and your no be no. I'll leave it with you.